Um, so before I give my, my talk on uh, sparse solvers and preconditioners, I wanted to let you all know about the academic uh, partnership and graduate fellowship programs that NVIDIA has. Um, the first one, the academic partnership, is basically you fill out a short application, just take you maybe an hour or so. Uh, if you have an advisor uh, or you, you know, you're a postdoc working with somebody, uh, you might want to get them to join you in this. And uh, the, the benefit is that you can get for free, uh, maybe one or two GPUs uh, to do your experiments. There's no, you know, catch. You, if they award you the uh, the grant, then you get to use these GPUs however you like. Um, there's also a, uh, you know, this grant um, that's a little bit more selective. So this is very common. This is less common, uh, but it's very sort of easy to do. And if you are, you know, doing GPU stuff and you'd like to run on the newest hardware, or you're just getting started and uh, would like to see if, um, you know, just get a couple GPUs in your uh, existing systems, uh, then this is a pretty lightweight process, uh, and I'd encourage you to uh, pursue it. Um, there's also a graduate fellowship, so if you've completed your first year of uh, your PhD program um, and you're in one of these relevant fields, uh, then you can apply to the graduate fellowship. I assume if you're applying to other types of fellowships, you can just reuse most of that application. Uh, and there, it's pretty selective. I think about 10 people a year get it, and there are you know, 100 or more um, submissions. Albert was a, a winner this most recent year. So the winners come from all over. Uh, it's very competitive, but the, uh, you know, it's, it's a comparable you know, uh, fellowship to other ones that you might be going after, like the NSF or DOE, things like that. Uh, so if you're interested in those, I'd encourage you to uh, apply soon, and uh, you can find this information on the research website at NVIDIA. Okay. All right, so today I'm going to talk about uh, some iterative solvers and give you just the intuition, like the details are very complex and really for most people you just want to understand them uh, as a user. You don't need to re-implement them or, or know the uh, ugly details. Um, and we'll also talk about preconditioning. You've heard a lot about preconditioning over the last two weeks. Some of you, you know, are using this in practice, uh, but for those of you that, that aren't all that familiar with iterative solvers, I thought it was helpful to sort of give you a lay of the land. So there are, you know, dozens and dozens of iterative solvers. Um, some of the more popular ones can be categorized into these two uh, general categories. There are stationary methods. Uh, so the, th the one that we looked at, the very simplest method, Richardson iteration, is a stationary method. And we'll describe what that means in a second. gauss seidel Jacobi, uh, these are, are common things that are very simple to implement. Uh, some of you have probably seen it before. These stationary methods have a purpose. They're not necessarily the most effective, but uh, people still use them today, and I'll explain why. Uh, and then there's the class of, of pre-law methods. Uh, most popular ones are things like conjugate gradient, GM res, uh, by CG stab. Uh, and I'll explain, you know, how to think about these methods in general and, uh, you know, how they can perform. So stationary methods, uh, it, it's kind of nice. Uh, how, how you can describe them. But you basically take your matrix A, split it into two parts, and we'll sort of see how we might split that. And then you just have this basic update scheme. And the idea is that uh, you want to split it into, you know, M and N. And when you split it into this M part, you want to make M easy to invert. Like, you want to be able to solve, you know, N, it doesn't matter. We just multiply N times our existing solution and add B. But then we have to figure out the next uh, solution by solving m, you know, x k plus one equals something. But here's, you know, uh, another way if we shift the m over to the right hand side. This is all the, the update scheme does. So you can implement this in, you know, one line of MATLAB uh, once you have your once you've decided how to split your matrix into two parts. So the the reason this is called a uh, a stationary method is that if you look at the solution, like if we looked at the true solution to this uh, linear system, AX equals B, and we plugged it in here, we would find that when we uh, applied this iteration, it would be a fixed point or a stationary point. So it, it would not change. The idea is that all solutions or all uh, vectors 
if we've chosen this correctly, will sort of converge to the true solution, but once we get to the true solution, it will just stay there. So uh, a, a splitting that gives rise to the Jacobi iteration is to take m equal to the diagonal. It's very easy to invert this. You just you know invert the diagonal entries, and n is everything else over here. Uh, and the way this works, uh, there's a variety of ways to look at it, but the one way to work to, to write it down is just in terms of algebra. Uh, you do this. You, you'll recognize this as the residual. So this is r in some of our previous. Uh, expressions. So it's basically we're updating the solution by the inverse of the diagonal times r. So if you remember the uh, Richardson iteration was kind of similar. We didn't have d here. We had some constant times r. So really Jacobi iteration is kind of like uh, Richardson iteration except we're using the diagonal entries to scale the update. And it turns out this is a much better thing to do. And the reason it's a better thing to do is that scaling by the diagonal sort of make sure the update has the right scale at each variable. So if the diagonal entries are, are very, you know, different, you know, you have a million here and one here on the diagonal, you want to sort of massage the update a bit and you don't want to just apply uh, the residual um, to, to the uh, new solution. Um, so is that clear? It's, it's a very simple iterative method. Uh, another way of looking at it is that uh, if you implement this not in parallel. So this is something you could implement uh, very straightforwardly in parallel. You just compute the residual, uh, apply the inverse of D. So this is just a vector vector operation. And then you add it back to your initial solution. Uh, another way of looking at Jacobi iteration and the way it's usually written down is that you have, uh, you know, a matrix. And for each uh, unknown, you know, so, so for each value in your X vector, you go through sequentially and just solve that row, ignoring all the other rows. Uh, and you do that in parallel. So there are two ways to look at it. This is sort of the uh, linear algebra way. Um, but there's a, a more sort of uh, procedural way that you can also look at Jacobi relaxation. Um, so Krelov methods, uh, there are, again, dozens and dozens of these, but a, a few uh, that are quite prominent. The idea with these is that we're going to, uh, you know, before we had an iter iterative strategy, we just sort of blindly apply the procedure to come up with the next iterate. In these Krelov methods, what we're going to do is pick a solution out of a, a certain space. And that space is called a Krelov space, and it's usually denoted, you know, K sub N. And it's developed, so if you give me a matrix and you give me a vector, the Krelov space is just defined by taking matrix vector products. So the first you know, element of the Krelov space is the vector V that you gave me. The next one is A times that V, and then we take A times A times V, and so on. So you, the way you can construct this you know, computationally, if you wanted to, is just to take your V and then compute successive powers of A. So each time you would do a, you know, generally like a sparse matrix vector product. So this is the, the Krelov space, and the way that you get a uh, Krelov subspace <laughs> method is to uh, find a solution in here that's best according to some measure. And the way you get different methods is sort of by defining best in different ways and exploiting certain properties of the matrix you're, you're working with. So the, the general procedure, uh, and this is the part that sort of defines the different methods, is you compute the residual you're going to develop a, a, a Krelov subspace based on the residual. So you take successive powers of, of A times this residual. Uh, you decide on the best uh, vector in this space, and then you update your approximate solution with that. So the, the GM res method, it, it's, the name is short for generalized minimum residual. It defines best as the smallest residual. So we want to find the approximate solution in this space that has the smallest residual norm. So when we take the, the norm of this residual, once we've applied the update, we want this to be as small as possible. Um, so this defines the method. Like th if, if I gave you this description, it would uniquely define GM res because after you work through the linear algebra, there, there's one thing that this can mean. So it, it's kind of nice in that way. Um, the cost of GM res grows pretty rapidly because it turns out to find this solution, 
uh, you need to do uh, quite a bit of, of uh, linear algebra, you get some uh, costs that grow as the square of n and n times the, the size of the matrix. So it becomes expensive. So what people normally do is they pick n equal to some size like 10. Uh, they'll <coughs> compute the best vector within a subspace of, of 10 vectors, apply that, and then restart the whole procedure. Sometimes this converges, sometimes it doesn't, but it's a, a very popular method uh, and it works for uh, general matrices. The conjugate gradient method, which we heard about last week, uh, is kind of similar. Um, you know, it's a Krelov method, but the way it defines best is uh, it's not saying we want the smallest residual. So, you know, before we had with GM res, we wanted the residual to be the smallest in the, the, the standard, you know, Euclidean norm. The way that G, CG defines the, the best vector is we want it to be the smallest in the A norm. So if we looked at uh, GM res, we wanted B transpose V to be as small as possible. With conjugate gradient, we want B transpose AB to be as small, small as possible. So the reason this makes sense, and it actually turns out to be quite a bit faster, uh, it, it imposes a restriction on the type of matrices uh, we can use. It, for a CG, it has to be symmetric and positive definite. And the way to understand that, they seem like, you know, sort of arbitrary qualities. Why do they matter? They matter because if you want this to be something that looks like a norm, so if you want it to be something that can measure vectors, uh, one thing it needs to be is symmetric. Uh, it needs to, you know, when you measure a distance, it should be the same uh, in either direction. And it also needs to be positive definite. So when we put a vector here uh, on either side of A, the quantity we get out needs to be uh, positive in order to be a, a valid uh, norm. So this is how you can define CG in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the, the choosing the best solution. There's another sort of way of, of going about it. Um, one, one nice quality of, of the conjugate gradient method uh, and the reason that lots of people use it is that if, if we looked at uh, the way that, you know, Richardson iteration, uh, you know, kind of iterated towards a solution or the steepest descent method, which is sort of, I guess, equivalent, it would sort of follow this green path where it would go along. So this would be the solution. This is where we start. And this is sort of how far away from the solution we are. These are the, the residual norms. If we looked at the steepest, des steepest descent, it would make the sort of zigzag pattern towards the solution. And this takes a long time because when we're, you know, going in the right direction, kind of, but it turns out uh, we're going to, you know, go back and forth uh, several times before we get anywhere near the solution. The conjugate gradient method is nice because when it goes along a direction, it sort of goes along that direction in a way that it never has to go along that same direction again. It turns out that this direction and this direction are what, what's known as A orthogonal. So once you've gone in a direction, you sort of exhausted that direction. You don't have to pursue that direction again in the future. Uh, and what that implies is that the CG method uh, converges in a fixed number of iterations in exact arithmetic. Uh, in practice, what it means is that CG converges much, much faster uh, than some of these other methods. Um, this is a, a simple problem, but you can see here the difference between doing Jacobi. It takes uh, about 1,600 iterations to get to uh, eight digits of, of accuracy and as measured by the norm. Uh, gauss seidel is better. It's a related method to Jacobi. GMRES is yet better, but CG is, is definitely the, the best among these. So the, the point here is that your choice of iterative method matters quite a bit. Uh, so you, you unfortunately have to be aware of the different choices. You need to be aware of your matrix properties in order to pick the best method. Certain matrices, you can't even apply conjugate gradients. So even though it's appealing to, to have, uh, if your problem is you know, non-symmetric uh, or, or not a positive definite, then you're going to have to look at more general methods like GMRES anyway. So, there are a lot of things to know. Uh, it's helpful to sort of know the, the broad categories and the, the most common iterative methods. Um, but know that your choice of, of iterative solver can influence your performance significantly. Um, so preconditioners are sort of separate from the, the iterative methods that I described before. 
Uh, and what they do is, is make those iterative methods run faster. So when we were picking directions before, or picking ways of improving our solution, uh, we had some notion of how to do that. But what a preconditioner does is it kind of gives the solver a little bit more information. So if, if I told you, you know, pick the, the, the direction that minimizes this, the way that we could use a preconditioner is to sort of influence that choice. Um, a good preconditioner is something that mimics the inverse of A. Uh, so if you, you, if you imagine that you had a black box that just inverted things, then it would be very simple to come to a, a, a solution. You would just compute a residual, apply this procedure, and then you'd be in one step at the, the true solution. The idea is that if we can find something, uh, a preconditioner that is uh, cheap to compute and sort of approximates A in, a, in certain, or the inverse of A in some way, then we can incorporate that into our iterative solver and arrive at a solution in far fewer iterations. So I'll give you a, an example of what that might look like. Oh, it mangled my figure here. So the, the simplest sort of preconditioner you might ever apply is just to take the diagonal of a matrix and take the inverse of all the entries. This is something that if you don't know anything about your problem, you don't know anything about preconditioning, uh, this is the, the sort of thing that you might apply blindly and sometimes it's actually a, a, a very useful thing to do, although the limits of, of what it can do are, are, are pretty apparent also. So the reason this works, uh, well, I guess I should show you. This is how you can use the diagonal preconditioner in uh, CUSP. It's very easy. You just pass your matrix to this class, uh, and then you can toss it in as the last parameter here to the iterative solver. Uh, the reason diagonal preconditioning can work is that sometimes the matrix you get in the first place has very bad scaling. So one way to slow down an iterative solver is just to take the rows or columns of a matrix and scale them by, you know, vastly different numbers. The diagonal preconditioner sort of fixes that. So it takes what might take, uh, might make your system very unappealing as far as the iterative solver is concerned and sort of fixes that a little bit. So in this case, I... I Create an example. Uh, I scaled the uh, rows and columns by some random values with very different magnitudes, uh, and then solved it with CG using uh, no preconditioner on the left. So it took 93 iterations. And on the right, I used the diagonal preconditioner, and I was able to solve it with just 13. So at the very least, uh, unless your matrix has, has nice, you know, nicely scaled rows and columns, uh, you should at least be using something like diagonal preconditioning. I can't promise that it will do much for you, but if you don't know anything else to do, diagonal preconditioning is very cheap, uh, and it can fix and improve the convergence of your method uh, in some cases. Uh, you may ask, well, you know, what if I use the identity as my preconditioner? The answer is this is equivalent to no preconditioning. Uh, so if you have a preconditioned method and you want to make sure that it's functioning correctly, one thing you can do is just throw in the identity here uh, and compare it to your unpreconditioned method. So the, the class of preconditioners that I work on uh, is, is known as a multigrid preconditioner. And the idea, you, you've heard quite a bit about multigrid in the last few days, but for those of you that don't have a background, I thought I'd try to give you some intuition. Uh, the idea with multigrid is that you have uh, different representations of the, uh, the grid in this case. So we have at left, you know, a fine grid, and then we also have a coarser grid. So there's, there's two components. We have a, a hierarchy of grids, you know, with, with coarser and coarser resolution. And we also have a procedure where we take, you know, a given approximate solution, and we can smooth it. So this just means we're applying, say, Jacobi relaxation or Gauss-Seidel. And the, the combination of these two features, what it allows us to do, we can take an initial uh, uh, error, like this is the error of the solution. After we apply the smoother, we're not actually getting rid of all the error, or most of the error, but the one thing about the smoother is that it's eliminating the high frequency error. So this is the critical thing. We eliminate the high frequency error, so this is a very, you know, jagged thing. Uh, the errors in this are, 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 are you know, high frequency. We apply the smoother. We haven't gotten rid of most of the air. Notice we still have you know, large peaks in the air. But what we have done is uh, gotten rid of all the high frequencies. 
And the critical thing is once, you get, you, once you've gotten rid of the high frequencies, you can represent that pretty accurately on a coarser grid. So the, the sort of complementary uh, ideas in multigrid are the ability to remove high frequency air and the ability to represent the remaining air on a coarser grid. If you have those two ingredients, uh, you can build a multigrid method out of that. And the advantage of that is that as we build these uh, coarser and coarser grids, eventually we get to a grid that's small enough that we can solve it any way we, we choose. We can use dense LU factorization to produce a solution and then propagate that back up through the hierarchy. So the, the class of multigrid methods that I look at are, you know, on this previous slide we had a pretty obvious geometric hierarchy. We had a regular grid and to produce the coarser grid we just sort of doubled the, the spacing of the, uh, the, the grid. Uh, so that's, that's what's known as geometric multigrid and it's very effective when it can be applied. Uh, what is known as algebraic multigrid is where I just have a matrix uh, usually, you know, it's an unstructured grid, but I just have a matrix, and from that matrix alone, I want to build a hierarchy. So I don't have any geometric information here. I just have a matrix. I can sort of interpret it as a graph. And the way I might build a coarser grid is to take uh, this matrix and just aggregate different components together. So what you see here is, you know, the, the uh, little clusters are going to be uh, my coarser grid values. So the, the things I need to come up with are I need to come up with these aggregates uh, in a parallel fashion. And I also need to find a way of transferring uh, a solution on the fine grid to the coarse grid that I come up with. Uh, so there are a lot of different techniques for doing this. Um, there are things where I choose some subset of the, the variables and uh, promote those to the coarse grid. That, those are the classical AMG methods. Uh, the methods I usually work on are known as aggregation-based methods, so they have this kind of uh, structure. But what's very appealing about this is that you can apply it to potentially lots of different problems because it only relies on looking at the structure of the matrix. Um, you can't apply it to general problems, like it, there are certain uh, limitations, so this is applied only to a, you know, certain classes of, of matrices. Uh, but for those, it can be quite effective. And the way we use this in CUSP uh, we have this smooth aggregation uh, preconditioner. You pass it a matrix, uh, then you feed it into your uh, CG, just like we did with the diagonal preconditioner. And what performance you get out of it, it, it of course, this, this is a very simple problem that I'm, I'm applying it to. But the performance difference can be pretty dramatic. If we use just conjugate gradient uh, and apply it to this problem, which is a 256 by 256 grid, uh, it takes 516 iterations to converge. If we use the preconditioner, the multigrid preconditioner, we converge in only 24. And actually the interesting thing about some of these multigrid preconditioners is that uh, this number uh, either grows very slowly, like the log of the size of the, the, the problem, or perhaps it's even a constant if we do certain methods. So it is a very, very appealing thing to do because this, this the growth rate of this is... Uh, quite a bit faster. So if I double the problem size, I may you know, double the number of iterations it takes. Whereas here it can be either constant or grow like a logarithm. So if you want you know, to solve a billion, uh, you know, a problem with a billion unknowns, uh, these are the kind of methods that you should be looking at. Um, there are a number of different parallel preconditioners. So there's a lot of work on preconditioning, but some of it is sort of inherently serial. Uh, things like incomplete factorization methods don't really have a, a great uh, amount of parallelism inside them. Uh, they're very common and very popular, but uh, we're going to really have to look beyond that to get effective parallel preconditioners. So I've listed some other types here. Polynomial just means I'm taking powers of A. Uh, it turns out those can be effective. Approximate inverse means I have some uh, inverse of the matrix measured in a certain way. So maybe it minimizes a certain norm on a row or column-wise basis. Uh, these are the kinds of things we're especially interested in working on, so if you have an interest in this, whether as a user or, or developing them, uh, please let us know. So I have a couple references here. If you want to know more about uh, iterative solvers, uh, you can't really find a better resource, especially because it's free, than uh, Yusuf Saad's book. Um, if you want to know more about multigrid methods, I'd point you at this multigrid tutorial. Uh, it's pretty helpful. Um, so anyway, uh, thank you for your attention, and that's the end of my talk.
Are there any questions? When you have a problem in an interactive method for which the solution for the problem doesn't converge, can you make make it converge by, by using a precondition? Uh, in many cases, yes. So the question is, if you have something that doesn't converge, can you make it converge with a preconditioner? Uh, yes, and, and the reason is that, um, well, I guess there, there's two. One is that the condition number of your, your matrix sort of determines how long it takes to solve. Uh, and it also determines sort of, uh, I guess, it, the uh, numerical sensitivity. So you can have failure to converge if you don't have a preconditioner just because the scales of the things become pathologically bad. Using a preconditioner, you know, applying M to A actually gives you a much nicer uh, linear operator. So you, by changing the, you know, the eigenvalues and the spectrum of the problem, you can actually get something which is solvable, whereas it isn't otherwise. Um, so I mean, some of it's just, you know, empirical. People tried it, it failed. They might not have understood why. Uh, but even, in, even if you were to do like a principled study, you'd find that uh, sometimes the preconditioning is essential to solve the problem, not just you know, faster, but essential in a fixed precision. Thanks. Okay, Oh, question? Yeah, I, I might have wanted to take a few offline, but um, I don't really do a lot with um, grids or anything like that. So, mm -hmm. several questions. First one is, how do you turn an unstructured mesh into a matrix? Do you just, um, okay. like, number each point and then the entries are weights at the edges? Okay, so what I've illustrated here is, you know, the geometric interpretation of the aggregates that I chose. Uh, but really what I'm working with is just a, a matrix. I, I don't have, you know, the geometry here. Somebody just gave me a, a sparse matrix in like CSR format. I interpret that as a graph. You know, that's the ordering that you're talking about. You know, it comes to me with an ordering because somebody's put it in a matrix. So from that matrix, I'll, I'll look at the adjacency structure and, and perhaps the entries of the matrix to pick this uh, aggregation. So from the, the matrix, I know who's connected to, to whom, uh, and, and I can, you know, based on their, uh, the values, you know, in the IJ entry of the matrix, I can decide whether or not to group them together. So now with that in mind, what does smoothing actually mean on a matrix like that? Oh, so, so smoothing, uh, so smoothing here, uh, the simplest thing you can do, like if you apply Jacobi iteration to this matrix, the way you can interpret smoothing is just taking the average of neighbors or something like that. For a, just, if you're just given a matrix and not some geometric thing, uh, smoothing might just mean uh, doing Jacobi iteration like, uh, like this. So this is a smoother. Uh, if you were to apply this process to the geometric problem, you get the same thing as taking the average of the neighbors, it turns out. Uh, in general, you can apply procedures like this to damp the high frequency errors in your problem. So, with that, would you, would you ever smooth a sparse matrix? Because it seems like if you're just averaging neighbors, like you create a many more non zero entries every time. Oh, so I, I, when I say average, I, I mean I'm just, uh, I always just have a vector. So, I'm taking in a vector and I'm, I'm writing out a vector. It's just that when I produce the output vector, I'm relaxing those variables. So one interpretation is that I'm averaging it if it's like a Poisson problem and I'm doing something like this. Uh, in general, I can just blindly apply this though and get a smoother uh, problem. So it, when we have a, you know, a geometric problem, we can interpret it in ways. We can say you know, the air is smooth uh, and it looks smooth. Um, when we just talk about AMG, so algebraic multigrid, we're just talking about you know matrices, and we'd say the the error modes with you know large eigenvalues decrease. So you can kind of get away from the geometric and, and physical interpretation of these things, and just say as long as the things you know the errors that live in this part of the uh, spectrum decrease, then I'm okay. So you you just break it down into linear algebra as opposed to this. But this is really the same intuition. So if you apply AMG to one of these type of problems, you should, you should still, still see the same intuitive relationship. So, okay, question? So, um, could you give us some examples in which uh, BCG stuff is better than GMRS and vice versa? Uh, there, there's a nice paper um, by Nick Trefethen 
where he sort of goes through, like the, a, a question would be, well, will we ever get, you know, the ultimate iterative method? Uh, and he looks at, you know, maybe five or six of the existing ones, and what he shows is that there is some problem for which each of these is best. Uh, so I, I can point you at that paper and they, they'll give you that. But it's kind of unfortunate because it means we can't discard any of these methods for at least some problem. Maybe they don't show up in, in you know, places we care about, but for at least some uh, artificial problems, uh, each of these methods that they considered, uh, including some I didn't talk about here, can be the, the most effective. Um, so what some people try to do is make their problem... Uh, uh, amenable to a method like conjugate gradient because it's very simple, uh, has very you know limited amount of computation. So if you have a choice of different finite elements, and, and one gives rise to a matrix that's symmetric and positive definite, and one gives rise to a non-symmetric one, then as far as the solver is concerned, this is a, a much more attractive uh, finite element space. You know, you as a as a you know computational scientist may still really like the quality of this finite element space, but there's a, a trade-off to me to be made there. So, question. Uh, how, do you, how do the precision affect the number of operations in, in your algorithm? For example, do you use single precision? Uh, for these, I, I did just because we make our examples run on you know all CUDA hardware, which means you have to use single precision. But uh, you will encounter cases where single precision fails just because the condition number grew too large. Uh, so it actually happens pretty often with, uh, our, we have a very naive implementation of CG, so you lose, you know, the uh, orthogonality of the vectors pretty quickly because you're introducing so, so such large rounding errors. Um, so it's definitely a problem, like double precision is the easy way to fix that, but really what we should do is make our iterative methods more robust so they monitor these things and perhaps restart uh, a process or something like that. So yeah, precision is, is a, an issue. Um, with these methods. Question? Uh, the, the condition number of your matrix uh, will slow down the convergence no matter what uh, precondition you are using? Uh, no. So the condition number, like if I, a simple problem, you know, like this one is kind of supposed to show where I'm doing a Poisson problem over this. The condition number grows, uh, I think it's like the square of the, uh, you know, resolution here. I forget what it is offhand, but with a multigrid preconditioner, so if you apply the M to A, the hope is that you actually get a constant. So the multigrid takes out all of the growth of the conversion, or the, of the condition number in principle, like if you've done it effectively. And for certain things, you can prove strong results. For interesting unstructured problems, there are very limited guarantees. Uh, so you know, there's just empirical results. Oh, it's effective. Oh, it's not. But yes, in, in some cases, you can completely eliminate the, the growth of the uh, condition number. Does the method work only when the solution vector is the discretization of a continuous field? Or can you use it for arbitrary linear system? Uh, in principle, you can apply... So this is geometric multigrid. It requires that you have, you know, a physical grid to coarsen. In principle, the, the multigrid idea, the multigrid strategy could be applied anywhere, but the hard part is that you, you need to have a way of eliminating the high frequency errors, and you need to have a way of representing the low frequency error modes somewhere. And it turns out, you know, we can, we can do that here because we have a physical understanding of, of what that looks like. You know, I can point you at this and you can say, okay, I, it's very obvious to me how I might represent this. In principle, you could apply that anywhere just by talking in terms of linear algebra. And the goal of algebraic multigrid is to remove all these constraints. But it seems just as a, uh, as a uh, you know, sort of fact of the, 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 the science that you sort of need to have some, you know, that we can do it without, you know, this much uh, structure, without that geometric information, but we still need some way, uh, the physical problems that we can apply multigrid to all seem to have this kind of structure in them anyway. So uh, I guess in principle, yes, you could apply it anywhere you wanted, uh, but in practice, it, to have those two properties where we can, you know, get rid of the high frequency errors and represent the, the low frequency errors on it, something, 
requires uh, you know uh, this kind of physical interpretation. So, okay. Well, thank you all for your time. And I think we have a break now. Sorry, a, a little announcement. Uh, we are not, uh, I'm not going to give any, any other lecture, but I invite any of you to LabComp at, uh, well, after the brief, if you want to continue with some of the um, lab exercise we were doing about MPI for Python. Just an invite if you want. Came with me. Thank you. And I'll email you my final versions of these. Oh, yeah. Sure. Um, Thanks. Um, where can I get your email address? Is it um, listed uh, uh, somewhere? Okay, sure. I'll email you. Sorry. I totally do that yesterday. Yeah. No, I, I know you. Yeah. But it's, it's pretty easy, actually. It's Anush at BU.edu. Okay. Yeah. Yeah.